I don't think there is, can be any doubt in the mind of anyone today that 21st century in the West, uh, we have become more and more hostile, not just unhappy with, but hostile to the Christian faith and to biblical morality. It's growing by the hour, every day, all across the world, not just in the United States, Canada, but in Europe and Australia and elsewhere. Oh yeah, people want to talk about God. <laughs> they can talk about God because they think, you know, God is this nebulous concept that uh, can be manipulated to mean whatever they want him to mean. They can talk about God as a force in the universe. They want to talk about God as this mysterious higher power, God whose ethereal entity somewhere in the universe. So, or even think of themselves as gods. Uh, a lot of people are into self-worship these days. You don't believe me, just watch the commercials. Probably self-worship and earth worship have become the fastest growing religions in the West. But the truth is that throughout history, uh, there's been all sorts of people who presume to speak for God or they presume to uh, uh, speak about God or even worse, to be gods. I'm give you a little bit of historic trivia, but you may not have heard it before. But during World War II, there was a summit between the leaders of those who were involved in, during the war in Yalta. Some of you heard about the Yalta, some of you read about it in history. There was President Roosevelt, uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and uh, the Russian dictator, Joseph Stalin. And in the midst of that conversation, as carrying on and talking about, you know, going to defeat the Nazism and so forth, which was fine. But during that discussion, the Russian communist dictator, Joseph Stalin, said, we the communists are destined to rule the world. God himself told me so. <laughs> Upon which President Roosevelt said, Joe, I said no such thing. <laughs> you get that tomorrow morning. <laughs> As I said, there's so many people claim to speak for God. Even some adults tend to confuse children about God and the nature of God. And it's like the little boy in Sunday school when the teacher asked, do you know where God lives? And this young uh, boy, Ray, sh his hand just shot up in the, uh, in the air and, 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 and he knew exactly where God lives. So the teacher asked him, he said, where does God live? He said, in our bathroom. <laughs> she was so intrigued and she said, uh, uh, wh why do you say that? He said, well, every morning my dad pounds on the bathroom door and says, Good Lord, are you still there? <laughs> All right. Now, be careful what you say in front of kids. <laughs> they tend to believe us. The question is, how do you get to know anyone? Anyone. How do you get to know a person? The only way you know anything about any person is what that person says about himself or herself, right? Am I right? Uh, back in the, in the 80s, I used to have a colleague, I didn't have too many colleagues, but I had a colleague um, who, uh, whenever he gets into a uh, heated discussion with any of the members, he ends the conversation by saying, well, Michael wants it done this way. That got to end the conversation when Michael knew nothing about the subject until I found out some really pe people very, very upset. Why do you want it? I said, I know nothing about it. So I said, only get from me what you know about me from me, right? The only way anyone knows something about you is not through what others say about you, but what you say about yourself. 
And this rule really applies more specifically, more particularly to God. It's not what I say about God. It's not what they say about God. It's not what you say about God. It is not what some big theologian says about God. It's not what a big mega church pastor says about God. No. What God says about himself. Can I get an amen? Amen. And that is why in this four-part series, it's going to literally follow the other four-part series, which we have just completed. We talked about the discipleship and the qualification for discipleship. Now, these are what I call the four required curriculum for a disciple or discipleship 101 because these are not electives. (laughs) These are required curriculum. Hear me right, please. Nobody, and I'm going to make a big statement, but nobody can be called a disciple of Jesus without fully comprehending those four things that we're going to be looking at. But don't take my word for it. I already told you that. Examine the scripture. Go to the word of God. I've said this for 36 years and I'll say for the rest of my life. You check me on the scripture. If it's not consistent with the scripture, throw it away. I am only opening the door for you to go in and to do this, continue the study yourself. God tells us a lot of things about himself in the scripture. And these are what we call the attributes of God. For example, God tells us about his wisdom. He tells us about his truthfulness. He tells us about his mercy. He tells us about his grace. He tells us about his justice. He tells us about his love. He tells us about his wrath or wrath as they say in England. He tells us about his goodness. He tells us about his faithfulness and on and on and on and on. But there is one thing, one thing that God says about himself that controls all the other attributes of God that I've just told you on more. And that is the sovereignty of God. Can you say that with me? The sovereignty. God's absolute sovereignty and rule over his creation is the axle around which all of his other attributes revolve. That is why if you miss the sovereignty of God, you miss the whole thing. Someone will say, well, wait a minute, Michael. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why is the sovereignty of God is the key that controls all of his his other attributes? Great question. Thank you for asking. Everyone here would agree. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I know that everyone here would agree that God is love, right? In fact, when I get to that subject of love, I'm going to show you how people are twisting that and they are using it to form a one world religion led by the Vatican. I'm going to get to that during this series. But we all agree God is love. Even non-believers sometimes say, yeah, God is love. Well, if God is not sovereign, if God is not absolutely sovereign, outward circumstances would thwart his love, right? If he is not absolute sovereign, then his love would be conditional, And the Bible from cover to cover says the love of God is unconditional. One verse that impacted my whole life, because I could stand here and quote you 100 verses from the scripture on the sovereignty of God. But because I have a short attention span, I I tell people I'm an ADD. How I made it through school, God help us, uh, but I made it through. In fact, I remember one time speaking to a small group of kids, and I said, you know, I spent 11 years in college. And the little girl said, you must have really been a bad student. (laughs) 
But I like us to focus. I, 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 I love focusing because that's just easier for me and I know it'll be easier for a lot of you. One verse that impacted my life, impacted my theology, impacted my ministry is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Again, I said I could quote many verses, but I want us to focus today. The Word of God said that God accomplishes all things according to the counsel of His will. What does that mean? It means that God's knowledge, God's authority, God's power, and God's dominion are all extended to the smallest thing in the whole of the universe. The little sparrow, Jesus said. In fact, I can tell you this. Some of my friends might not like it, but I'm going to tell you anyway. This morning when you brushed your hair, some of you brushed your hair, so I thought we brushed your beard. God says... Number 1,555 hair, come on out. And it came out in the brush. That is how absolute in control our God is. That's what the sovereignty of God means. God said it and God affirmed it in his word. It means that God's power is above and beyond and beneath and around everything. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, beloved, listen to me, please. Listen to me, because I know this is a a thorny subject to some people, depending on what church you come from. Denominations fought over this. A friend of mine wrote a magnificent book, somebody you would know, and then three of the big preachers on televisions who proud themselves of being his friends refused to endorse the book. Because there's a chapter in that book on the sovereignty of God. These big preachers said, hey, the power is in your tongue, right? You decide and God obeys you. How blasphemous. How blasphemous. In all of the confusion that surrounds us right now, God's plan stand supreme. Nobody... Nobody, nobody can thwart the plan of God. Someone said that God's ways are behind the scenes, but God moves all the scenes that he's behind. In 1977, I was in graduate school in California. We come across from Australia to attend this particular course on cross-culture communication. And all of the students from all over the world were coming to this particular master's program. It's a unique program, but we all were mid-career students. We, you know, some people, in fact, at, at 29, I was the youngest in the class. There were so many people in their 40s and 50s, of missionaries for years, of pastors. And I remember distinctly when a professor got so carried away waxing eloquently about Jonah. And as he got carried away talking about Jonah and how Jonah is an example of how man can frustrate the plan of God. Jonah is an example of how man can stand in the way of God's plan. How Jonah is an example of how disobedience can thwart the plan of God. Jonah is an example of how um, he forced God to change his plan from plan A to plan B. Meanwhile, I'm sitting there in the back. I mean, I was squirming. I mean, literally, I was cringing, to say it, put it mildly. Finally, I raised my hand. Because I don't want to burst his balloon. But on the other hand, he's shredding biblical truth literally uh, before our eyes about the sovereignty of God. Back then when my fellow students see my hand go up, they know it's going to be the end of the lecture. (laughs) I'm so glad you did not know me back then. (laughs) 
No, as I said, we were already ordained, been to seminary. We, we have, we're mid-career folks. But I just raised my hand. And I said, sir, when I read the story of Jonah, I come to the opposite conclusion. Ultimately, Jonah did not frustrate the plan of God. Ultimately, Jonah was not able to frustrate the will of God. Ultimately, Jonah was dragged kicking and screaming into the plan of God. Ah, all of Jonah's disobedience managed to accomplish for him, bless his heart. All of his disobedience accomplished has got him inside big jaws. Yeah, back then, the, the film was very famous back in 77. The younger people want to know, probably they'll know about the film. But it was a big, big thing in the 70s. Big jaws. I said, that's what managed to, it, this, his disobedience managed to get him into, into inside the big jaws. His disobedience got him to swim in the slimy intestines of big jaws. Uh, it bleaches his skin. <laughs> it blistered his ego and pride. It makes him... It made him nauseous and sick as all of disobedience does. And then finally it got him vomited on the beach of God's mercy and grace. Why? Because God accomplishes what? Are we going to get it up on the screen? God accomplishes all what? God accomplishes all things according to what? counsel of his will. I'm going to get you to memorize it. God accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will. Say it with me. Beloved, listen to me. Those of you who've been hearing me a long time, or those who don't, you might be hearing me for the first time, I'm telling you, miss this one and you missed everything about God. Even the, the little girl, you know, expressed her understanding of the sovereignty of God when she was praying one night and she said, Lord, bless my mommy, bless my daddy, bless my grandfather, bless my grandma. And God, please take good care of yourself. Because if anything happens to you, we would be in a whole lot of mess. But I am sure, I am sure, Eclectic group like this, somebody was saying, Michael, Michael, what are you trying to say? That we do not have a free will? Of course you have a free will. Of course you have a free will. But your free will has no power over the sovereignty of God. Those who choose to reject God's offer of forgiveness and eternal life through Jesus Christ bring upon themselves Dark eternity. Those who choose to live without God, God lets them have what they want. God respects our choices. And don't miss this, don't miss this, don't miss this. That too is also part of God's plan. Because God accomplishes what? Okay, let's do it again. God accomplishes what? All things. Can you say, shout all things? All things. I want the devil to hear it. All things. According to the counsel of his will. Ah, oh, but there's one thing that you and I must know about our creator of the universe. He's the sovereign ruler and king of all of creation. But you know what? His years of experience and pastoring in three continents and, uh, have taught me that most people, sadly some church people, but most people come to two erroneous conclusions when they hear about the sovereignty of God. Both erroneous conclusions. On the one hand, some people deny the reality that God's supreme rule is over all things. On the other, some deny the perfect goodness of God in governing authority over the universe. Both are erroneous. Some wrongly deny that the reality, others wrongly deny God's nature. Some will say, 
either God is not perfect in perfect control or his will is not perfectly good. Books written about that. These are two easy conclusions that the human flesh, that fallen part of us that is not redeemed yet, will come to, especially, listen to me, especially when we see evil, pure evil and suffering in the world. I want you to know, I understand that. I really do. In fact, I have been in both erroneous conclusions at one point in my life. Because we humans, we want to bring God to our level. We cannot stand not being in control. Are you with me? All of you type A, say amen. amen. <laughs> like this bunch of jokers, all he ha they have is money. And they get together uh, for one week a year in Davos, Switzerland. And they play God. And they really think they're God. God bless Al Gore's cotton pick and socks. <laughs> <laughs> they really do. They think that, you know, because we, we're too dumb to understand. They are going to tell us what, what. See, both of these conclusions are false according to the word of God. Why? Because God accomplishes what? God bless you according to the counsel of his will. Now let me deal with this by asking you to ask yourself two questions, okay? Ask yourself, answer yourself, don't have to tell anybody else. <laughs> the first question is this. Now, you can answer them to me loud, that's fine. God is not going to be upset with you and yell in the church, especially when answering a question from the pastor, right? Is it okay to be baffled? Is it okay to be baffled when you see God doing things that you don't understand? God bless you. That's why I love this congregation. Yes! Because as creatures, we do not know all the reasons for everything God does. God is not accountable to us. We have no right to demand that God explains everything to us. Listen to what God said in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than yours. But you know what the problem is? I really think, and, I, I've, I, and I've seen this with my own eyes in, in, in folks. Uh, we think that God, and they treat God almost like a, a government official. You know, the governor or president or somebody, a politician. They really do. That's how they view God. As if God has to explain his policy to us and defend his decisions. And if he doesn't, we're going to vote him out of office. Now, there are some people who need to be voted out of office. <laughs> Don't misunderstand me. But because we don't know how to vote God out of office, we turn our backs on him. Because we don't know how to vote God out of office, we cut him out of our lives. I've seen some Christians, even in disappointment and anger, they, they kind of have a, a cold love toward God. Please listen to me. I love this republic. I, I, I escaped 54 years ago from the country of my birth to come and experience this freedom in America, which we're losing every single day. But that is not the way we should view God. Listen to what Moses said in Deuteronomy 29, 29. It's easy to remember. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which he revealed to us belong to us, why? So that we may obey his law. 
Now, there are several things that the sovereign God reveals to us. Some things he reveals to us. He wants creation to know him. I'm talking about general revelation. He wants us to know certain things about him. He wants all of his creation to know certain things about him. But not everything. Not everything. Now the second question, I told you two questions to ask yourself. The first one, is it okay to be baffled? Okay? When you see things that don't make sense and say, why is God doing this? The second question is this. Does the sovereignty of God mean that we know nothing about God? No. No. Absolutely not. That's what Christianity is all about. That is why Christianity sits aside from all these other religions. That's what sets the Christian faith above and beyond all the others. God fully revealed himself in Jesus. God has given us all the information we need in order to have to make, be able to make a rational decision. God revealed so much about him in Jesus. Why? So that we would decide whether we receive him as Savior or Lord or reject him. And we receive the consequences. Do we love to submit to him or reject him? Question. What does God want us to know about him? I'm talking about humanity in general. I'm going to come to the disciples in a minute. What does God want humanity to know about him? Listen carefully, please. This is all the word of God. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm not intelligent enough to come, with, come up with the answer. He wants us to know that God loves to save repentant sinners. God wants us to know that he spent many centuries preparing the world for the coming of his son. That God wants us to know that right on schedule, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into the world. God wants humanity to know that those who have received the gift of salvation and eternal life should share it with others. God wants us to know that his son by dying on the cross, carrying our penalty of sin, satisfied the justice of the Father. God wants us to know that his son was resurrected from the grave on the third day to assure the believers of their own resurrection. God wants us to know that his son was exalted on the right hand of heaven and he's ruling and reigning on his throne of over on the rim of the universe. And that is... From the throne, he invites sinners to come to him, to repent of their sins, and to come to him, believe in him. He lovingly leads them after that throughout their lives. And finally, he brings them home to himself, heaven. That's what he wants all of humanity to know. Then what? For those of us, who have come to him, those of us who responded to his invitation, those of us who call ourselves disciples of Jesus, those of us who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, what does he want his disciples to know? What does God want his disciples to know? Again, it's in the same word of God. What the sovereign God want for those who have responded and accepted his invitation to know? What does God want believers and disciples to know? I keep repeating this to so understand the difference and the distinction. He wants them to know that because that he is sovereign and in control, therefore all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He wants his disciples to know that he wants all of them to conform to the image of his son Jesus. God wants Jesus' disciples to know that they should live this life without fear of the future because he controls it. 
God wants all of his, Jesus' disciples to know that they should live this life without anxiety and worry over their circumstances because he controls them. God wants all of Jesus' disciples to know that they should live this life trusting in his provision, taking him at his word, believing his promises, obeying his commands. That is and that is every diligent disciple should know that God is at work in his kingdom and that his everlasting arms are underneath them. God wants Jesus' disciples to know that he is our security and that he, the creator of the world, never gets tired like we do or grows weary. God wants us to know, the sovereign God wants his disciples to know that he is in absolute control of your job and of your home and of your children and of your health and of your breath. The sovereign God wants us all, to Jesus' disciples, to know that no matter how impossible the dream that he's placed in your life, that no matter how difficult the task that he has given you, that no matter how long it takes to accomplish what he wants you to accomplish, that no matter how fierce the opposition in your calling, that no matter how ferocious the enemy is, is that no matter how bleak things may look, no matter how helpless they may seem, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings of eagles and they will run and never get weary. And to top it all, to top it all, he gave his disciples, the disciples of Jesus, his own Holy Spirit to empower them, to empower them to overcome, to empower them to live for him, to empower them to do all things that he calls you to do. Oh, my beloved friends, my beloved friends, listen to me. The sovereignty of God should tell all of Jesus' disciples that his grace is sufficient regardless of what is happening. The sovereignty of God tells all of Jesus' disciples who are daily walking with him and trusting in him that an almighty fortress is our God. Finally, the sovereign, sovereignty of God should tell all of Jesus' disciples that if God be for us, who can be against us? A Yusuf translation, if God is for us, I pity anyone who's against us. Boy, you want to give God glory, give him glory. Go, give him glory. Go ahead. I always tell you, don't clap for me, clap for him. Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, swords? No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am absolutely certain that neither death nor life, angels or height or depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I know this is not probably how they teach the class on the sovereignty of God in seminaries or Bible schools. But this is all you need to know. That's all you need to know about the sovereignty of God. And if you have never accepted his gracious invitation, whether you're watching around the world on Kingdom Sat or online, wherever you may be, or here in this beautiful sanctuary, if you have never received this gracious invitation, if you've never received the gift of eternal life and the joy of knowing that all of your sins are forgiven, you can do that today. You can do that today. You can do that today. How? By repenting of your sins. Not embracing them, not taking pride in them, but in repenting of them. 
And when you do that, all of God's promises for his disciples can be yours. Can I get an amen? amen. Would you stand up and pray with me? Jesus said there are great joy in heaven when one person, one person repents of their sin and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so in the privacy of your home or privacy of your heart in this place, if you have never surrendered your life to him, say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive all my sins. I repent and turn to you. Lean only on the everlasting arms. Lean only on the power of the Holy Spirit. For I pray that in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, if there's a problem with us who know you and love you, your disciples, Lord, <laughs> it's apathy. Father, your church growing apathetic, your bride infusing us a breath of life, renewing us the power of your Holy Spirit so that we might be a light to the Gentiles and to the nations and to all non-believers, wherever they may be. Father, we pray and cry that out to you in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, that name to whom all knees shall bow, and all tongues will confess one day that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And all of God's people said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jeremy.